It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Watts, who is the Mitchell A. Byrd Professor of Conservation Biology at the College of William and Mary and Director of the William and Mary Virginia Commonwealth University Center for Conservation Biology. Dr. Watts received his Bachelor of Science degree from Virginia Tech University. He received his Master of Science at the College of William and Mary, and he received his PhD at the University of Georgia. He has studied birds since early childhood and has conducted more than 500 research projects focused on solving conservation problems, primarily within the mid-Atlantic region of North America. As an undergraduate student, he worked on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Bald Eagle Restoration Project. Over the past two decades, he, mo he has monitored bald eagle habitats in the lower Chesapeake Bay and has con conducted more than 50 different research projects on the ecology of the recovering population, which it certainly has. Brian has also authored 250 publications on av avian ecology and conservation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Watts. It seems a lot, like a lot, but it's an absolute thrill for me to be here with you um, and celebrate bald eagles. Uh, it's great to have so many people interested in this uh, particular species. Uh, Reese is going to talk tomorrow about the history of the nest that's here at the Botanical Gardens and some of the things that's happened with this particular nest. Uh, but I just wanted to say that it has been fantastic, and all of us in the conservation community appreciate um, how well the garden has been a custodian of this pair. And not only that, um, the fact that the garden has been willing to share this pair with the world. And I really can't express just how important that is for the broader conservation of this species, for us to allow the public in to look at these uh, particular pairs and to be more involved with them and educated. So I really appreciate the Botanical Gardens um, program over the years. I am from the Center for Conservation Biology. We are a research group that just works with birds. Uh, many different birds in, in addition to eagles, but eagles have certainly been uh, one of our uh, focal areas over the years. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. I'm going to say some things just generally about bald eagles, um, something about their plumages and their annual cycle, and then I'm going to say something about the population history, hopefully a little bit more about the population history than what you know about currently. And I'm going to say something about the future management and concerns of our population here in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, yes, bald eagles are one of a group of about a dozen species of sea eagles uh, that have a worldwide distribution. Um, they're all very similar in their ecology in that they depend on large water bodies. And these species are mostly associated with aquatic prey. And one of the interesting things uh, for bald eagles is that they're restricted to North America, and they're the only representative of this particular group of eagles uh, in the New World. So there is no representative of this particular group in South America, which is sort of an oddity. They're throughout the rest of the world, primarily uh, Africa, Europe, um, <coughs> Australia. And interestingly, if we look along the Atlantic coast, one of the large water bodies that we see is the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay historically has been a major stronghold for this particular species. And their ecology here is a bit different than elsewhere in the range. And that's what makes it such an interesting thing to study them here in the bay. Uh, most of the population is actually distributed um, east of the fall line. So this is the tidal reach of the Chesapeake, all of this here that is essentially east of I-95, and this is the real area. Uh, eagles breed throughout the huge um, watershed of the Chesapeake Bay, um, but in terms of density, um, where the action is, is the tidal reach of the bay. And so it's been the real uh, stronghold, it's what's recovered the most, and not only that, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, the tidal portion is overflowing with birds, and the Chesapeake Bay, I believe, is responsible for the recolonization of surrounding states like North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, etc. Uh, much of those birds, I believe, that are now growing in those regions probably originated from the Chesapeake Bay and have dispersed from here. So it is very important um, to eagles along the entire Atlantic coast. This is an odd image here, um, but I wanted to, to show you here that one of the reasons that the Chesapeake Bay uh, is so important to eagles and other fish-eating birds and many other species is because it has tremendous productivity. The Chesapeake Bay is one of the most 
productive aquatic ecosystems in the world. And you can see that here demonstrated. What these colors represent is primary productivity. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the Chesapeake Bay sort of glows. And in fact, the productivity in the Chesapeake Bay is about 15 times what we see in inland lakes. And it's about 20 times what we see in the open ocean. So there's a lot of energy concentrated in the Chesapeake. As you know, it's shallow, so there's good light penetration, tremendous primary productivity, and that fuels the food chain which supports these species, including bald eagles. And we see this every day, right? We depend on the productivity of the Chesapeake Bay in terms of seafood and so forth. And of course, these other species, whether it's great blue herons or osprey or bald eagles, also depend on that seafood. And so, you know, when we think long term about our harvest of these resources, uh, we should consider some of these other species' needs uh, in those uh, deliberations. One of the things that um, I am asked quite a bit about is, um, are young eagles full size um, when they leave the nest? And the answer, of course, is yes. Bald eagles are what we refer to as determinant growers, meaning that by the time they can actually fly, they have reached adult uh, size. In fact, as you may know, um, bald eagles at the time of fledging oftentimes weigh more than their parents do. Um, so um, here you can see an example of that. Here's a young bird next to an adult. They're essentially mirror images of each other. So they, they actually are full size when they leave the nest. They're not like snakes or fish that continue to grow over a longer period of time. Um, I wanted to show you uh, sort of the succession of plumages um, here in a couple of series of pictures. So this is what the nestlings look like just before fledging, and actually this is what they look like for several months. Um, they're what we refer to as chocolate birds, meaning that they're an even color uh, throughout their plumage. They're very dark, but in addition to the plumage, um, look at the face. Look how dark the bill is. Look how dark the eyes are, and you'll see how that changes as we go through a succession of... Um, plumage changes. So this is a second year bird and you can see they're much more modeled in their plumage here. They don't have the consistent chocolate color here. Um, the bill is starting to lighten up though you can't see that very well here. We'll be able to see it in the next image here. Um, so this is a third year bird. This is my favorite plumage. Um, they're completely different than adults, but something about the coloration on the head matches the eyes, matches the body. And it's a, it's a different motif, but to me it all works together. Um, you can see here, it start to change here in the upper mandible. The lower mandible here is now yellow. You can see the sear changing, and you can see a big change in the iris here. See how it's changing towards a yellow. You can see a hint of the hood pattern here, but it's not white. Um, this particular individual here is what we refer to as a white belly. Um, these, this is an alternate plumage, so in the third year you can either have a, a dark belly or a white belly like this. The white bellies, at least in this region, account for maybe 10 to 20 percent of the individuals. Um, but we see them a lot in the population. And this is a fourth year bird. Notice how the pattern is beginning to emerge more uh, pronounced now. Let's look at the bill, how it's changing. The sear is completely yellow now. Look at how clean the iris is and how it's changed to a yellow. Um, still have some dirty here in the hood, and that signifies if we could see the tail, we would see that that dirty pattern is also in the tail. It's mostly white, but typically has some uh, dark feathers, dark spots. And this is a classic adult plumage, so this is reached typically as a transition plumage in year five. And notice that the bill is now a clean uh, yellow color. This bird may be much older than five years. So once they reach this terminal adult plumage, they continue to have that plumage until they die. So it's consistent, and they may have this plumage for 20 years or more. Um, but you'll notice the eye is very clean now, and the, the body here is much darker. You can see the white tail here. Um, Oftentimes when we catch these birds like this, um, one of the better indicators of health is how clean the bill color is. You know, is it very bright? Does it look uh, clean? And the eyes, um, sometimes they'll be a little off color. I like to see them as more towards an orange, you know, and that tends to indicate, at least to me, that this is a really healthy individual. Uh, here's the head um, of a different individual, actually. Look at how clean this bill is. And it's not just the bill, it's the soft tissues around the eye here, the eye ring here, the superorbital um, 
uh, skin here is also yellow. Look at how powdery white the uh, hood is. So that's the transition in plumage that we see that occurs over a several year period. And that plumage change coincides with reproductive maturity. Typically, we don't see birds um, becoming reproductively mature until they're five years old. Occasionally, we'll see a, th a three- or four-year-old bird breeding in this population. We've documented that many times. But typically, um, it's the adult plumage that we see as breeders. And I wanted to mention, um, this is from some of our research. This is from a paper from last summer. And I wanted to mention that learning doesn't end once they start to breed. And here's evidence of that. So uh, this particular one is brood size, and one there indicates the first year of a territory. So these birds are five years or older, so they establish a territory. And what you can see is quite an increase here in brood size here as these birds get older. So presumably these birds at year 10 would be 15 years old. And you can see that this pattern has not ended, right? It hasn't reached any kind of climax and then begun to decline. And so reproductive rate continues to increase at least as far as we've analyzed it. So they are learning. They're learning to be better breeders, better foragers, better defenders, and those sort of things. So these eagles have a long learning curve that keeps going with experience. And here's another indication of that. This is a proportion of territories of different age that have produced three chick broods, which is typically our maximum. So it takes an experienced pair to produce a three chick brood. It's a lot of effort that has to go in. They have to be good foragers and good providers. And you might know that the Botanical Gardens has been one of the champions in the Lower Bay in producing three chick broods. It takes a lot um, to be able to do that. And you can see here in the first year um, that three chick brood rate is less than 20%, okay, less than 2%. It goes on up to 16% and keeps climbing. So these older pairs, like the Botanical Garden, is likely an older pair that successively produce three chick broods. Um, it takes quite an experienced um, pair of adults to pull that off. And um, they're not that common in the population. Uh, something about the size, the body size. So this is how we weigh eagles here. This bird's been immobilized, and we put it on a scale here. Um, and I just wanted to show you what some of the differences are here. Um, you might know that uh, in this particular species, we have sexual size dimorphism where the females are larger, typically about 30% larger than the males. That's true for this population. Our particular population is about midway in body size between Florida and the extreme northeast of the range. And so there's a latitudinal gradient in body size. Ours is sort of about midway. The, the individuals down in Florida are quite small. Some of the males are very tiny. We call them peewees when they come up here into the bay. <laughs> and they might be the size of red tails, very tiny birds. Um, but our males here uh, weigh about seven to eight pounds. The females are more like about 10 to 12 pounds. As you go further up in latitude, they might reach 14 pounds. So the Alaska birds are the largest ones within the range, and they can reach those kind of sizes, the females can. So they are different in size. Uh, this is one of Dwayne. This is the Norfolk Botanical um, Garden pair. I have looked at tens of thousands of photos of eagles, and in, at least for my taste, this is one of the best photos I've ever seen um, because it shows the pair together. You have a good size comparison here. This is the male here in front, and it's not just a matter of differences in body weight. They're not equals. So if you see these flying and you, you see a lot of individuals flying, you see that the proportions of their bodies are different. The males have a sleeker body, and their wings are thinner. And so the wing loading is quite a bit different if you see them flying. Um, so it's not just a matter of, you know, taking a Xerox machine and enlarging the male and you have a female. There are body proportional differences between the sexes, and you can see that here. You can see how thick the female's uh, neck is here, and that continues on down. So there, there are differences in shape that, you know, after a while of looking at these, you can pick up on. And <laughs> One of the other characteristics that we use to sex the birds uh, is foot size. This happens to be a fourth year female and this is a third year male. And look at the differences here in the feet. Um, females have considerably larger feet and that's typically one of the best ways that we have to sex them. There are also difference in wing cord and weight and other things. But when you look at the birds, uh, the males have thin toes and they have a smaller uh, grasp. And I think you can maybe pick that up here in between. So there are differences between the sexes here. 
So just to recap some of that, they are determinant growers reaching adult size by fledging. Females are typically 30% larger. Males have sort of a sleeker body form. Uh, there's a plumage sequence that gets closer to the adult with each successive molt that we see through the years. Um, the plumage pattern changes, and it's not just the plumage, the soft tissues and the hard tissues also change in color. And learning continues after reaching breeding age. And um, what we see is an elevation in breeding performance that goes on at least as far as we've recorded it. Maybe it goes on for 20 years. We don't know. All right. I wanted to say something about the annual cycle that we see here in the Chesapeake Bay, what we expect at different times. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of things here. Nest building is something that we actually can see year round here in the Chesapeake Bay. Our birds are resident year round, which is different than some of the Florida birds that may migrate or birds from the Northeast that migrate at different times. Our birds typically do not migrate, and so they're on territory uh, year round. Um, nest building intensifies, though, here in the Chesapeake in about mid-October. We start to, start to see more interest in the nest, more actual maintenance activity typically, and that peak sort of runs through about mid-February or so. Uh, incubation typically uh, runs in this period, mid-January through early May. Uh, laying actually starts in the lower bay uh, for some of our pairs. Some of our earliest pairs on the James River may lay uh, December 15th or so. And so by the time we do our first uh, aerial survey, those birds might have chicks that are 40 days. But they are way out ahead of the rest of the population. Um, between the James River and the Potomac River, there's about a five-day difference. And so birds get later and later as we go north. And if we were to go down into North Carolina, they continue to get earlier. If we get down to Florida, Florida has a completely different breeding period where they're actually uh, finished breeding typically by mid-May, early May, and that's when they migrate up to the Chesapeake Bay. So their, their breeding season is much, much earlier um, than ours. Um, we typically have small young in this period here from the early March. So most of our birds have laid by mid-February or so, and most of them start hatching sometime in the March period. It actually peaks somewhere here in April. Uh, we have large young in the nest, um, sometimes as late as early August, but most birds have fledged at that point. One of the periods that we know the least about is the post-fledgling dependence period. And we get a lot of questions about this. How long do the chicks stay on the natal territory? How long are they provided for by the adults? How long do they stick around? Do the adults chase them away? Those sorts of things. That is one of the reasons that we have been putting transmitters on chicks over the past several years. We've put out maybe 22 transmitters on chicks, and we're interested in resolving some of this. It turns out that it varies quite a bit. Um, some of these uh, chicks leave the territory within a couple of weeks. Other ones may stay three or four months, um, at least from our tracking data, before they leave the territory. What causes the difference, we don't know. Um, but it's quite, it's quite a variable uh, parameter for bald eagles. Uh, peregrine falcons, quite different. Peregrine falcons, when they hit 50 days, they're gone. Um, but bald eagles seem to be more variable than that. And we're interested in some of the reasons for that. All right, something about uh, some of the nests and so forth. Uh, this happens to be a nest up at Quantico Marine Base. <clears throat> and you can see the typical structure here. Um, the nest is comprised of a large base, which is made out of large materials, uh, typically one to two inches in diameter, quite large materials. Um, then it's built up with finer materials. And finally, we get to the sort of inner part that we refer to as the cup or the egg or the egg cup uh, or uh, yeah, the egg bowl, yes. Um, and it's typically with uh, fine materials. And here you can see a clutch of three eggs. Typically here in the bay, it's one to three, rarely four. Interestingly, if you look back into the 20s and the teens of the 1900s, there were a lot of clutches that were collected in the bay that were four or five eggs. There are a couple of six egg clutches. And we sort of wonder, what's the story with that? Were there multiple females involved? Was it one female that was producing those large clutches? We don't know. Um, but they were documented. Uh, we have uh, virtually never documented a four egg clutch. We've only had one four egg, uh, four chick brood in all of the years that we have flown. Uh, literally tens of thousands of breeding attempts and we've documented one four chick brood that was on the James last year. Um, there have been two other ones documented in the Bay. One documented last year on the Pocomoke River in Maryland and the other documented in the mid 80s further up in Maryland uh, on Remington Farm. Um, so they're rare. Um, the other thing that we see with this particular nest um, is garnishing. And um, 
oftentimes we see this with raptors. There's many raptors that use garnishes. They'll, they'll typically take uh, conifers. Here you can see some cedar material, but they often take uh, loblolly pine boughs and they'll bring those to the nest. And you'll see them doing that repeatedly throughout the brooding period. And it's generally believed that these conifers or evergreens uh, give off chemicals that are sort of insecticidal in their quality. And so that's one of the reasons for the garnishing. Uh, this is what the egg size looks like. They're fairly large eggs, fairly meaty eggs, about the size of a baseball. So fairly large, they're about 90 grams or so. Um, incubation, this is a nest over on the eastern shore. Incubation typically lasts for about 35 days or so. Um, and both sexes incubate, so they trade off. But typically the female has the night shift and she'll be replaced by the male um, in the early morning and then she'll go off to feed and she'll usually come back late morning and it'll go like that through the day. And I should say that the females rule the roost around the nest, right? So they're dominant to the male. They're not only larger, they're dominant. And so when she wants to take over, either with incubation or brooding or something like that, she does. When the male brings in fish, she takes it. So. Um, <laughs> She is completely uh, dominant to the male, typically. And let's see if this will work here. Um, so this is a, a short little piece of video. Let's see if it'll run. Yeah. So this is a hatching event. Um, and hatching actually takes about 24 hours. It begins when the bird breaks through the air sac. So there's an air sac um, or a chamber within the egg. They'll typically break through that so that they can breathe and then they'll start rotating through to pip the shell in a circular manner and eventually they will break through. Uh, this is a very traumatic period uh, for chicks and this is not just true for eagles, it's true of all birds that a lot of chicks are lost at this stage. So it's a very dangerous stage because they can hear, adhere to the shell, they can sometimes not get out of the shell. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, sort of period when uh, a lot of chicks are lost. All right. So this is a chick shortly after hatching, um, and you can see that it has a white type of down uh, that we refer to as natal down. This is a wispy type of down. It doesn't provide a lot of insulating qualities. Um, we see these from the air, and um, they typically, so they start to lose this down when they're 10 days old. So we know how old they are when they have this. We refer, we refer to these as blondies because um, you can see them distinctly uh, in the nest. Even though we're flying over at a reasonable altitude, when you see them, it's a real characteristic color for them. Here you can see the classic uh, egg cup here. See how this uh, fine vegetation has been formed into a cup and that holds the eggs, but it also provides a tr tremendous amount of insulating uh, properties. So the adults can actually sit on this and create a dead air space and they can heat that air space and it's insulated around. And so it serves a, a great purpose, not just to hold the young chicks and the eggs in place, but to provide some insulation there. Uh, these are a couple of chicks up on the Parappa tank just off of the York there. These are about 15 days old. Notice that the, the natal down has been replaced with a new set of down, and this down is darker. It's actually thicker and has tremendous um, insulating qualities. Uh, it's like a down coat, and these birds can get overheated on a hot day because they're there in this coat, and it gets hot, and you'll see them panting in the nest often. Um, one of the things that I want you to notice with these next couple of slides is how their posture changes. Um, chicks of this age typically sleep a lot and they're always hunched over. So they're down on their elbows when they're standing. They're not able to get very linear or upright. Notice too how large their feet is. Um, <laughs> Uh, eagle body parts grow at different rates, and so different body parts may grow early, the feet grow early. And so they reach their maximum foot size fairly early on, and then the rest of the body parts sort of grow after that. Uh, this, is a chick <laughs> this is a chick that's about 30 days old, and you can see it's starting to get its contour feathers here. Uh, notice it's a little bit more upright, and it has more gripping capability here. The, the feet are starting to look like they have some um, ability to grip. And notice the, the outer side of this nest here, what we refer to as corralling or railing. Um, the adults will put these sticks around the edge and it sort of keeps the chicks in there. Yeah, let's see. Uh, this is a, a nest at Camp Perry. And um, these chicks here are in the early 40s. They're 40, 42 days old. Look at how much more upright they are. They seem to be much more alert. 
um, their body proportions um, are actually changing. Uh, you can see a catfish head in there. Um, interesting for Ed is that these two chicks were recovered later as breeders and taken to the Wildlife Center. Both of them, you know, we banded both of these chicks and both of them, uh, a number of years apart, were taken to the Wildlife Center, uh, which is amazing really um, because they were in the same nest and it was several years until they were recovered. So unusual situation there. Um, this is a chick that's more like 50 days. You can see it's much more upright now. Um, one of the other things that you'll notice is the feathering. Um, these birds actually feather out when they're sort of in the mid 40s. And so all of the rest of that period from uh, the time that they're, you know, several weeks, let's say six to eight weeks until they're 12 weeks, they're mostly feathered out and they're mostly grown. And that last period there um, is really a period of control. They start to learn neural control and coordination and they'll need that later. And so that later period of growth or development is mostly uh, coordination development. Eagles are large birds. This is a large female here. They have wingspans of six to eight feet and there are consequences for body size, right? So there are a lot of things about their ecology that are sort of dictated by their body size. And here's an example of that. This is a nest up on the Rappahannock River and most of their nests are large. And they're large because they need a large platform to raise two to three chicks. These chicks are large um, uh, when they get to near fledging. And so they need quite a bit of space and so these nests might be six to eight feet across, some of them a little bit less than that. So it's a large structure. One of the things I'd like to point out here is that um, these are male and female. This is a male, this is a female. Because females reach a l larger terminal size in development, they tend to put on feathers later. So you can come into a nest like this, one will be completely feathered out, the other one not so much. Um, and it's because of the gender differences. So the males are able to divert energy to feather growth at an earlier age. And so you get this sort of asymmetry in the way that they look there. These chicks are off pouting in their own side of the nest though, you can tell. <laughs> so the nests are large. And this is a nest on the upper bay here in a, in a willow oak. This is Craig Copey who works for the Fish and Wildlife Service. He was out banding with us one day and you can get some idea as to what the size is. Quite a trick, I can tell you, to climb over that nest structure there to get up in. Um, but this was, a, this was a huge tree here. So they, they require large trees to support the, the size of the nest that they need. Uh, here's some other examples. This is an old graduate student of mine, Catherine Markin, and me. In her project, we put a lot of cameras in nests, did a lot of growth work and diet work, so we climbed a lot of um, trees. But it gives you some idea of the variation in nest structure and the size there. All these right here are on the James River. And so um, they require large trees, and here's some examples of that. Um, so these are both trees on the James River. Um, and you can see the nest up here, a uh, fairly large nest. You might be able to see me right there. <laughs> and this is Dana Bradshaw down at the base of the tree holding the climbing line. So these are not small trees. Um, here you can see me here. This is only about a third of this tree here. Um, so they're fairly large trees to support that kind of um, nest structure. This nest here is about eight feet across at the, the surface. So fairly, fairly sizable. I wanted to also mention that although the vast majority of nests that we have in the Chesapeake Bay are in trees and in the lower bay it's loblollies and as you go up into the lower saline reaches of the bay it turns to hardwood. Um, but we do have other structures that are used. This is a tower up at Aberdeen Proving Ground which has been used for years and years. It's a uh, Monocacy Tower. And here you can see the brood on that uh, tower nest there. And so they are increasingly using uh, human structures. Um, in this particular property, there are three nests in towers like this, and we have a number of them throughout the bay on cell towers now and also on transmission towers. So they're starting to adapt to some of these structures that we're seeing. Uh, yeah, here's, here's an unusual nest that's been here for about four years. Uh, this is on a little shack here on the eastern shore, and uh, this particular shack is on Little Cobb Island. And um, this particular pair, there's, all, there's no structure out there. There's no trees or anything, so they've decided to nest on this roof. Um, and I, I flew over this nest uh, this week, actually on Wednesday, and they have one chick there this year. So they, they seem to be doing okay. But that's a fairly large nest as well. 
And this is an unusual nest. Uh, this is out on Bloodsworth Island, which is just above Smith and Tangier Island, out in the middle of the bay in Maryland. And uh, the Department of Defense put a number of uh, platforms out on Bloodsworth uh, for great blue herons. And this uh, bald eagle pair has decided to nest there. That's only about 10 feet off of the marsh there. It's a really low tower. So, and, you can, and if you look at the nest, you can see it's driftwood. It's made out of driftwood. So. Um, at any rate, um, substrate does vary a little bit. We're starting to see them use a number of different structures, and I'm sure that's going to continue. One of the other things besides trees that eagles need is an open foraging area, typically a peaceful foraging area away from disturbance. And this is the type of scene that we typically see that they like for that. And um, <laughs> I wanted to say a little bit about diet. So this is a pair up on the York River, a couple of chicks. And it's a blue catfish, uh, which was actually introduced in the bay in the late 60s. But anyway, um, about 95% of the prey that comes into nests here in the Chesapeake Bay um, is fish. Uh, the rest of it is typically aquatic oriented, but a huge portion uh, that's provided to um, the chicks is fish. And here's a, a nest up on the Potomac River. And I'll point out here what you already know from the botanical garden, that is, here's a fish here, but here's a gray squirrel. And so they do, <laughs> they do use mammals quite a bit. Um, we'll see squirrels, we see um, skunks occasionally. Occasionally, I have found evidence of use of fawns, deer fawns, uh, by eagles. And I've reviewed some papers on them feeding on deer fawns. Um, but the most abundant um, uh, mammal that they use, uh, at least, the most numerous that they use is muskrat. So we see a lot of muskrat use, particularly in the upper bay. And it's one of the dominant mammals that they use. On two occasions, I have found beaver skulls under nests, but they were small beavers. Beaver's a big animal. And here's a nest on the eastern shore. And th this, is, this is typical here in the bay. These, these adults will absolutely pile food into the nest. So food can be super abundant in the nest in a particular development stage for the chicks. And you can see the, the diversity here. This is a striper. I'm not sure what species of fish these are. But one of the things that I want you to notice is that there are actually six diamondback terrapin shells here. There's one, here's one, there's one, here, here, and here. So it's a species of turtle that is associated with salt water. And um, this particular pair seemed to love them. <laughs> and over about a four-year period, I went to a lot of nests and collected turtle shells to look at the species they were using. Mostly they used mud turtles. Here's a box of turtle shells that were collected from eagle nests. Um, so they do use quite a bit of turtles, but different pairs seem to have a taste for them. You'll go to one nest and there might be 15 turtle shells. You'll go to other ones, they won't be any. So it seems to vary pair to pair as to who likes the turtles. <coughs> I wanted to mention too that um, the nests in a territory move around over time. And here's an example of that. This is a territory, this shows a 40 year history of this pair's movement on the Potomac River. Um, and I wanted to mention that this particular property was owned by John Dos Passos, who is an American novelist. He died in the late 1960s. But this was his house here, and he owned all of this property here, and he absolutely loved the eagles. And uh, his children still own the house, and they still will not sell this land because of this pair of eagles. And so that's the type of families that you hope to run into, you know. Um, but why is it that they move around over time? Actually, about 30% of our pairs move annually. And here's one example of that. This is Mitchell Bird looking into a nest that's been blown down. But what happens oftentimes is that these nests are struck by lightning and killed. And they, once they die, the, the pair occasionally will, will move, uh, or they'll stay with that nest until it falls over, more rarely. And this particular pair stayed with this nest. This is at Plum Point up near West Point on the York. And uh, in a spring storm, while this bird was incubating, um, we had flown the nest and the bird was incubating. About two days later, a storm came through and snapped this tree off because it was dead. Um, and so we know the bird had eggs. And so Mitchell is in here looking around for uh, eggshell fragments this day. Another reason that they leave nests is raccoons. This is Catherine. About two days before, we had flown this nest and there were eggs in it. And so we went in um, to put some camera equipment in. She got up here and uh, met this raccoon, you can see here. <laughs> and um, 
She got up there, the raccoon started to come down, neither one of them knew what to do. Uh, so finally, this raccoon jumped over her onto the trunk here and went on down to the ground and ran off. Um, but raccoons take over about two to three percent of our nests annually and they'll actually live in the nest. They'll burrow down into the center of it and we'll fly over and they'll stick their head up out of the hole there in the middle of the nest and look around. Um, but they actually use the nest structure to burrow in and live there. And they'll, they'll have their own young within the nest. And we've also had some raccoons eat chicks all the way up to eight weeks of age. Uh, we don't have a lot of documentation on how many chicks they take. All right, uh, horned owls is another reason. Horned owls don't make their own nests. They'll nest in other species' nests, like red-tailed hawks or osprey or crows. But one of the species that they use is bald eagles, and each year uh, we lose about 3 to 5% of our nests to horned owls annually. And so we'll fly over the nest, and a horned owl will be incubating or have chicks. And we've documented cases where we've had eagles incubating, and then a week later or so we have horned owls incubating. So for whatever reason, even though they're considerably smaller, they have a nighttime advantage and they are able to actually take over nests, we believe. <clears throat> so in terms of requirements, um, they need adequate nesting substrate with good crown access. We didn't mention that, but they like isolated trees that have access to the crown because eagles are large. Uh, they also need a large habitat patch for nesting with disturbance-free buffers in close proximity to large water bodies. And they also need disturbance-free foraging habitat and typically with ample prey. So those are the main requirements that we see for um, the eagles. I wanted to mention something about the history of the population and some of the constraints that we've seen over time. I'm sure you're familiar with DDT and how it caused the population to climb, but I want to mention some of the earlier constraints that we believe have affected the population over time. And the first one of those is land clearing. You know, when we colonized the lower bay, we started to clear land for agriculture, and that continued for a considerable period, reaching a height in about the 1880s. And here you can see that. From pollen uh, cores here, we can see that by about 1840, almost 50% of the landscape was completely cleared in the bay. That actually continued through the Civil War, and I'll show you some pictures of that, and reached well over 50%. So the forest was actually cleared. Here's an example of that. So this is a Civil War picture of Yorktown, and look at the horizon here. It's an open bald. It's like an open grassland. This is Jamestown Island looking across the thoroughfare toward Williamsburg in the Civil War era, and you can see it's been cleared. This is Petersburg, um, one of the forts in Petersburg. You can see some scattered trees out through here, but not many. And this is just on the outside of Richmond. And so it's something that we don't think about these days because th we've had secondary succession, the forest has come back, um, but we had a huge clearing period um, from about the mid-1850s to about the 1920s where most of the east was open grassland. And one of the, be the best indicators of that that I know of is that in Bailey's book, which was written in 1913, he mentions that on the peninsula, peninsula meaning Newport News up to Williamsburg, which is where he lived and, and bird watched a lot, that in 15 years, he only had five records of blue jays. That's something that we can't imagine today, but it's because there weren't any forests for blue jays to be in. So that's how dramatic the deforestation was at that period. And the relevance today is that there was a bottleneck. There was a bottleneck in tree availability for that early 1900s period. And we still see the evidence of that today. This is what I refer to as a survivor. This is a tree in Charles City County. And it's a huge tree, it's probably 200 years old. So this tree existed during the Civil War. It's one of the survivors of that era. And these survivors are huge trees and they're the ones that are sought out by bald eagles for nesting habitat. This particular tree is like the grandfather to this patch here. If you walk into it, it has a huge base. Here you can see the nest on the top of it. This is a huge nest, but it doesn't look that huge in this big tree. So these are survivors. These are the type of trees that um, eagles are sort of seeking out for nesting. Here's another example of this. This is up in the upper bay. This is a, a white oak. You can see the base of it here. I'm getting ready to climb up to a nest there. There's been a nest in this tree for years. But interestingly, we believe that there was a nest in this tree in the mid-30s when uh, Bryant Terrell surveyed eagles in the Chesapeake Bay, and he describes a nest, we believe, in this tree. And so this is a tree that's very long-lived, and it likely had eagles in the early 1900s. There was a gap there when the population declined, and now it's had another uh, pair of eagles nesting for maybe 20 years or so in it. So there are some survivors out there from that time period, and eagles really are attracted to those trees. 
So there was this period of land clearing. There was a period, um, these are occurring all through this time period, but in terms of their zenith, in terms of their impact with the bald eagle population, we sort of entered into a new period here of shooting and collecting. Uh, eagles were shot routinely throughout the bay. Uh, they were considered to be competitors. They also took chickens and other things, livestock um, from farms, and so they weren't considered uh, friendly. Um, to most of the residents, and so they were shot routinely. Bryant Terrell talks about coming into a house on the eastern shore of Maryland and going into the living room, and there were marks on the mantle there. And he said, what are the marks? And they were marks of the wingspan of all the eagles that they had shot. So they put the, the, the wingspan there and marked the, um, the widths of those uh, spans there. So it was routine at that time. Uh, it, not so much now. This is an old picture. I took this when I was an undergrad and I worked at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. We had four birds uh, come in shot from one county in the eastern shore of Maryland in one month, and this was one of those birds. Um, this, was, this bird turned out to be an amputee, uh, and the other ones uh, were dead. But anyway, um, shooting was much more common even during that period than it is now. I'm sure that Ed still gets birds in at the Wildlife Center that are shot occasionally, but it's not nearly uh, as widespread and common as it was at one time in, in this region. This is Harold Bailey, who lived in Newport News and that wrote uh, Birds of Virginia in 1913. And H.H. Bailey was a large collector. Um, and so here he is in a heron colony collecting heron eggs. Um, here he is up the tree collecting uh, red-bellied woodpecker eggs. Um, but he also collected a lot of eagle eggs. And so this was common. Um, the collectors would either shoot adults for specimens or they would collect eggs. And they would use these to build collections and trade and so forth. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And here's a catalog from 1922. Uh, and these, this is sort of like a stamp catalog where people were trading eggs and specimens and so forth. And you can see here at Bald Eagle, um, the price there for a single egg was $15. So if you got a three egg clutch, it's, it was quite a bit of money at that time. And so it was quite a bit of collecting throughout the bay. And that's how we know something about clutch sizes and so forth because we have a lot of clutches in um, museums still from that era. But at any rate, this did have an impact on the population. Um, it's a a uh, issue that really stopped about this period with the passage of the Eagle Act in 1941. So it was waning through the earlier part um, of the 1900s. Uh, so the, the impact of that, we don't have collecting really now. So it's pretty much something of the past. About World War II is when we introduced DDT and other contaminants into the environment that I'm sure you're familiar with. And so we entered into a period of biocide being the major constraint on the population. This is something that you're more familiar with probably, the use of DDT and other contaminants, um, particularly for crops and for mosquito control throughout the region. It was used widely. And we had fairly high concentrations. In fact, some of the, the concentrations of DDT in eagle eggs in the Potomac River were some of the, the highest um, reported throughout the species range. And so there was a lot of it used here in the Chesapeake Bay. And it certainly was responsible for sort of the last chapter of major decline of our population, where our population reached the nadir in the early 1970s here in Virginia of only about 20 breeding pairs. And that brings us to uh, sort of what we know about the population. Uh, each year, uh, we fly surveys throughout the lower bay in Virginia, and we're checking uh, uh, old nests. We're looking for new nests to map them and to monitor the population. And I'll stop here just a minute to say this is Mitchell Bird. Uh, this year was, last year was Mitchell's 35th year flying the survey in Virginia. It was my 20th. We've been flying together for a long time. Um, but Mitchell really was sort of one of the fathers of the eagle monitoring in the Bay. There were grandfathers, as in Fred Scott. Um, there was a great grandfather, as in Bryant Terrell. But Mitchell has, longer than anybody, um, been associated with the population and surveyed. Um, absolutely great conservationist. So what have we seen? Um, this is a reproductive rate. And I should mention here that this is a maintenance level. So the pairs have to be producing uh, this many chicks in order to replace adult mortality and for the population to be stable. And so what actually brought the population down in the, from the 40s to the 1960s was that we were not producing enough chicks um, to offset mortality. And it wasn't until uh, DDT was banned in 1972 and a little bit later than that that we re reached maintenance levels. So you can see here that we reached maintenance levels about 1980, and we have been above maintenance um, every year since then. So the 
population reached sort of a plateau here in terms of reproductive rates, and notice that the one survey that we had in the 1930s, which was pre-DDT, the Bryant-Terrell survey, is fairly even with what we have now. And so we have sort of recovered our reproductive rate, and the population has been growing tr tremendously because of that. And so this is actually an old graph. It doesn't come up to present. But you can see the exponential growth that we've had. This is the recovery goal that was set in the 1970s. You can see that we went right through that in the mid-1990s and kept going. And currently, we're about four to five times higher than uh, what the initial recovery goal was. Um, last year, we were at about 730 pairs here in Virginia. So the population has been growing exponentially with a phenomenal doubling time. We've been growing at 8 to 10 percent per year uh, since the 1970s. Just tremendous um, growth. And I wanted to show you some of that. So this is when the population sort of reached a low in 1970. Here's the nest that we knew of, these red dots here. And I'll show you some decadal changes from the survey. You can see that by 1990, we were over 100 pair. And uh, the population is starting to sort of get some traction there. And this is 2010. Um, I didn't put a, a slide in here for 2011, but it's, a, it's another 10% higher. So the Chesapeake Bay population overall is approaching now probably about 1,500 pair. And we estimate uh, from some modeling that maybe the maximum might be something like about 2,000 pair. So we are coming right on along here towards some type of saturation. So there's the change that we've seen. This was in 2010. We're considerably above that value now. Tremendous uh, recovery. One of, the, one of the, the greatest conservation success stories of our nation's history. So um, it turns out that this period here, um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring period, was actually relatively short-lived. And it's what we would refer to as a demographic perturbation. That is, reproductive rates were down. We removed EDT. Reproductive rates uh, rose again. And the population has responded and recovered. And we have recovered back to probably well above what we were before the 1960s. Um, I would say the population right now is probably as high as it's been in 300 years because of all these earlier periods of constraints on the population. The population has been released to truly recover. So something about the, the population, habitat loss due to land care, clearing and commercial fishing. Uh, there was a bottleneck there in that period. Population suffered from uh, collecting and shooting uh, eggs and specimens. Uh, I didn't mention, but there was also a bounty in this area um, because they were believed to compete for fish and other things. So there was a bounty, similar to the bounty that was offered in Alaska that's so famous. Uh, DDT resulted in a dramatic decline. Population reached a low um, in the early 1970s. And the population has been dramatic. <clears throat> so what ended these different eras here, you can see we had reforestation, the Eagle Act ended most of the shooting and all because of the penalties for doing that. Ban on DDT ended the biocides. Now we, since 1980, we've entered into sort of another era of constraints. That is our expansion of um, the human population on the landscape. <clears throat> This, the, these are a series of pictures here from the Upper Potomac where we've seen truly industrial scale development consuming habitat. And that development is sort of rolling down the Potomac out of DC and it's being fueled from tremendous resources there. And here's an example of that. This is the, the human census. This is the human population census put graphically uh, into census blocks. That's what this map shows. This is the census from 1949. And I'll show you how that's changed up to um, 2000. So we are expanding out of these population centers, and we are consuming habitat. And really, that's the, one of the, the true concerns that we've had. And we've been working on that at the center for the last 20 years, trying to understand you know, uh, what types of patterns are we seeing. Are there refugia within the landscape? And there are. We have refuges. But not only do we have. Um, sort of ownership refuges, the Nature Conservancy properties, Fish and Wildlife Service refuges, state refuges. Um, but we also have um, what we refer to as policy refuges, like uh, the Wetland Acts and so forth, which protect certain habitats that eagles are actually using. So we have considerable refugia within this system that will allow, these, that will allow eagles to sort of um, exist within the landscape, even though we consume quite a bit of it. So we've been studying these things for quite a while. 
And one of the most uh, sort of surprising things that we have had, and we didn't expect this in the 80s and 90s, is that eagles increasingly are starting to live with humans. This is a nest up on the Potomac, and it's right in this guy's backyard next to his pool. <laughs> and, um, you know, this, this family here uses the backyard plenty, and this, this eagle pair seems to um, be okay with that. And so we're seeing more and more of that. And this is sort of what we hoped for, you know, because if we're, cons if we're consuming more and more of the land with residential development, our hope then is that eagles can adapt what they're doing and be able to exist with us. And that way there's more habitat available. And the best examples we have of that are where? Here in Tidewater. Uh, Reese follows a number of pairs that are in these residential neighborhoods. This pair here in the Botanical Gardens is an example of that. Incredibly tolerant pair to human activity. And with that habituation to human activity, the hope is that they can sort of move their niche toward us and we can uh, be together. And long term, as we consume more and more habitat, that's really the hope. <clears throat> ah, but it's not just a matter of habitat. And so there's a lot of indirect effects that we see from our existence on the landscape that impacts eagles in different ways. This is a, a chick. This was only two weeks ago. This was in Picosa, and there's a nest near this pole. And when this bird fledged, it moved over onto this pole and was electrocuted and taken down. Um, but this is something we're seeing throughout uh, the bay. Wherever eagles coincide with us and the infrastructure that we need for our own uh, existence. I want to show you some of the things that we're working on related to this. <clears throat> This is a project we've been doing for quite a while. This is Aberdeen Proving Ground, which is a military installation in the Upper Bay in Maryland, just above Baltimore. <clears throat> and these are eagle mortality events over the last 20 years. And they have had about 70 of these over the past 20 years of birds um, either hitting wires or being electrocuted. And so they, they contacted us to do some uh, research to help them to prioritize lines for retrofitting and for burying because they knew they had an eagle mortality problem there. And so that is what has actually led to the tracking. Uh, we have outfitted about 70 birds, this was in 2007 and 2008, with satellite transmitters. These are actually uh, GPS satellite hybrids. This is the GPS uh, antenna here, this little bump here, and this is a satellite antenna here, solar powered here. So this unit is an incredible piece of technology. Uh, it collects data, GPS locations, stores it in a database, and then transmits it through satellite to us, and we get that database on locations. So this is a typical backpack harness trans, uh, transmitter configuration. So we have fitted this bird uh, with a backpack harness and transmitter. Uh, here you can see some birds, um, some photographs of birds. You can see this uh, transmitter here on these birds. So what do we get from that? Um, this is the movement. So these are GPS locations here, and these are uh, movement vectors between these locations. For This is for one bird for about three months or so. And this is Aberdeen Proving Ground here. And so with this cohort of birds, we have now collected about 800,000 GPS fixes. And we're using that data to help understand their spatial movements and their overlap with the hazardous infrastructure there. Okay, this is uh, only uh, a couple of weeks from one bird. And what I want to illustrate to you here is that there are a number of communal roosts here that these birds use at night. So this, this particular satellite transmitters are programmed to take a fix every hour and then they take one at night so we know where the birds are roosting. And we've used this to delineate communal roosts uh, within the property. But one of the things that we're most interested in are these. So these birds use common uh, highways you know, and so the real question is, are there highways of movement and superhighways of movement within this property that can help us to prioritize lines that may be the most hazardous? And so we're wanting to know how birds move throughout this landscape. And that was sort of the, one of the purposes of this um, project. Ah, so this is some modeling that was done just this week from this data set. And what was done was each individual bird, we looked at the probability of movement. So this is a, a fairly complex model um, that looks at probability of movement for each bird. And then we stack all these birds together so we can see how the population is using the landscape. A couple of interesting results here. Um, this is the summer period. So this is all the birds we are tracking during the summer period. And you can see these hot spots here are primarily positioned along the shoreline here during the summer. You can see them here. These are high use areas. This is the winter period. 
And you can see that the distribution is a little bit different. This is the, the Sassafras River here, and you can see that they moved up to Sassafras, and it's sort of lit up here. And you can see that the association with the shoreline is a bit less during the winter period. And we can see this more dramatically if I look at lower probabilities. So if I display lower probabilities, we see maps like this. This is in the upper bay, I should mention. This is the Susquehanna River here. It's, this is overlaid on. And so you, we can see actually the broader distribution of these probabilities. And we can see some interesting features here like these bridges. These are where birds are actually crossing the bay. You can see this is an island here and they're moving across in specific locations here. But they're still primarily associated with the shoreline because they're feeding on fish along the shoreline. But as we get to the winter, what we see is that they're feeding in more inland locations. So they're feeding more on deer carcasses and other types of things, maybe waterfowl that are inland. So they're not as restricted to fish as the fish go deeper. Okay. And here's a zoom in here of Spasuti Island. This is the, in the original image that I showed you, there was a lot of mortality here, there was a lot of mortality here, and there was a lot of mortality here on Spasuti Island. And you can see why. It's because these are real focal areas of eagle movement activity. These are real hot spots. And this black material here, these are um, electric lines. And so you can see where these high spots of activity overlap with the electrical infrastructure, we're getting a lot of mortality. And so these would be prioritized as areas that we need to change the electrical lines there to protect eagles. And so this is the direction we're going uh, with this research in order to try to minimize some of the impacts of the electrical infrastructure and help DOD make sound decisions about what they should do with their um, electric lines. So the rate of land conversion to urban use is unprecedented currently. I didn't talk a lot about that. Uh, we could have talked for an hour about that, uh, but it would have been pretty boring. Um, <laughs> but demand for residential is highest along the shorelines. We all know that shoreline uh, land is very valuable. Land conversion leads to a suite of indirect impacts like uh, electrical infrastructure, mortality, things like that. Uh, eagles are becoming more tolerant of humans, and uh, this is a positive sign for us. You know, if they can move into our neighborhoods and be okay, then we don't have to worry as much about the loss of some of the, the nesting habitat that they require. Maybe we can coexist. I should point out, though, that currently, uh, when we look at the overall population of Virginia, the ones that nest in urban areas are less than 5%. Um, so it's still a relatively small portion of the population that is moving into these areas, but it's at least moving in the right direction. Birds are beginning to habituate to human. Uh, slow increase in urban nesting, and the lower tidewater area, as in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, is sort of leading this trend in the state. We have more pairs in urban areas here than we do elsewhere in the state, for whatever reason. And the one right here in the botanical gardens is a good example of that, and how well they've done here in this setting has been spectacular. And we, we have ongoing research to look at secondary impacts. I wanted to mention that we are sort of reaching a uh, capacity, and there's some implications uh, for that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so I wanted to just mention briefly here, um, so this is a, a modeling uh, exercise, and we don't need to be worried about the theoretical ecology. What I want to point out to you is that once we reach saturation, and in this particular case I've saturated at 100 pairs, what happens is that the population continues to produce chicks, but those chicks don't have a place to go. And so we get all these floaters at reproductive age. And it turns out that if we go along this line here, we reach a stable point, which is a stable age distribution. And the point I want to make is that we're right now at about 1,500 pairs here in the bay. That's about 3,000 3, breeding adults, right? Well, the implication is at saturation that all of these other age classes are about eight times. There's some consequences of that for the breeders, isn't there? And we've seen that here at the Botanical Gardens. <laughs> and uh, here's, a, here's a sequence that shows that. So here's a bird that's incubating here. This is a third year bird. Okay, this is a sequence that shows this bird coming down and attacking this um, incubating adult. And there was actually uh, another bird at the same time that was a fourth year bird, and it was circling around too. And these birds ultimately broke this nest up. So this, this pair failed, and it was a young pair. They were not able to fend off these um, juveniles and it was broken up. And th th this territory was actually abandoned the next year, so they're not breeding there now. This was actually in Richmond. Um, 
But this is one of the consequences is that there's a negative be behavioral feedback loop of all these floaters being out there because they're wanting places to breed. And so they're wanting to take territories over. And so the result of that is that we have increased adult mortality and injury. And I'm sure Ed is getting more and more individuals in every year that are, uh, have been subjected to combat wounds and, more, and uh, deaths. And so we're gonna see that continue to ramp up. And the other result of that is that we get a reduction in productivity because these birds are constantly breaking up nests. And the example here at the Botanical Gardens right now is that there was such a turnover in young females there uh, that nobody got to breed, right? <clears throat> well, I have a graduate student. Her name's Courtney Turin. This is Courtney here. And Courtney has been studying the intrusion rate of all of these floater birds. And she is using two types of camera. This is a nest cam. You can see this little bullet cam that was mounted above the nest here in the early part before the breeding season. And she's also using what we're referring to as an intrusion cam. Here you can see the nest. This is at Westover Plantation. And you can see that she is uh, off at a distance looking for intruders that are circling the nest. And she's trying to quantify what the intrusion rates are to look at this negative feedback. For me, personally, in terms of the ecology of eagles in the bay, this is sort of the last chapter. You know, what happens um, internally within the population that brings that population into balance with the available space? It's this negative feedback that does that. You know, the population can't grow indefinitely because it runs out of space. It's this process, this interference, that brings that population into balance with the available space that it has. And so there's an important ecological mechanism that's playing out, and we're trying to study that now. Ah, now we get to the end, and that is that, um, just a couple of comments, and that is that people like me who are interested in avian ecology and spend our life, you know, in avian ecology, <clears throat> we think, at least when we're young, that avian ecology is sort of the answer to conservation. That is, if we understand what they need and we understand uh, what their issues are and what it is, how they interact and that sort of thing, we can um, effectively uh, conserve them. But as we get older now, like me, uh, we realize that um, ecology is only a small part of the pie, isn't it? And that is that um, there are other disciplines here that come into play that are really effective here, and that's sociology and economics. Those other disciplines, you know, have to come together for us to be effective in conservation. It's not just knowing what the birds need and their ecology. It's these other disciplines that have to come into play. And so the point is that... <laughs> Conservation requires, you can see Shelly there, conservation requires that people work together. And I think one of the great impacts of the botanical gardens here is that the botanical gardens has been effective at bringing people in to the equation. And that's what we need. You know, everybody needs to work together ultimately to protect these birds, right? And so uh, the botanical gardens has done a great service in educational and outreach to the public. And it's something that's priceless, really, you know, for those of us who are working in the conservation community. All right, so I'll end it on that note. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for about three questions. Thank you, Dr. Watts, please. I've done this over the last eight and a half years of watching the fascinating things to me is once they lay the eggs, you can actually count 10 days. You can count the 35 days in anticipation of the birth of young eagles. And I've noticed that both of the adults within a few hours of the birth will actually begin to tilt and listen. And I'm assuming that they can hear the young chicks calling through the eggs. Is that a fair <clears throat> yes, and uh, they hear a couple of things. One is that once the, the uh, chick breaks through the air chamber, so there is an air chamber at the top of that egg, and once um, the timing of this has to be exactly right, just like the birth of a human child. You know, the timing of respiration is critical there, and it is for these birds uh, as well. So they break through this uh, egg cham the air chamber, and they start to breathe for the first time in that space. Um, shortly after that, they begin to peck in a circular way, and actually they're moving around. They're rotating within the egg, and they're pecking in a circular manner to break off the cap of that egg, like we saw there. And so, yes, those things are, are audible. Um, the birds can hear them uh, pecking on the inside of the egg, 
and those chicks also make uh, sort of little squealing noises um, that they can also hear. So yes, I do think they know when hatching has begun. How near another nest will another pair build their nest? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So historically, we thought, you know, based on some historic distribution data, that birds needed about a mile of shoreline. Um, and that was sort of based on some analysis that was done in Alaska, which we thought was sort of at capacity all these years. Alaska didn't have the same kinds of declines that we did. Um, it turns out that um, we have rewritten that because in many of the parts of the bay, um, birds are packing in tighter and tighter. And that's been going on for years now. You know, we keep expecting for pairs to start to breed in, in higher densities on the eastern shore, which they are, but most of the packing is, occur is occurring in the lower saline reaches like Williamsburg to Hopewell and the James. And some of these birds are at incredible densities and we have seen uh, pairs that are sort of, uh, you know, on opposite sides of a clear cut and it's clear that the birds can sit on the nest and, and look at each other in the eye across the space. Um, so they, you know, some of the closest ones we have, uh, you know, might be 200 meters or so, not a mile. And they're really packing in tighter and tighter. Where that ends, we're not really clear. But it, it, they're getting closer and closer all the time. Yes? Um, I live uh, 150 miles west of here, over in the central Shenandoah Valley, and live on a farm. And for the first time ever this past, during this past winter, we had adult eagles on my farm. Um, and I believe also some immature eagles, maybe as many as five at a time. And while I am <coughs> Yes, absolutely they are. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have as good a handle on the areas beyond the fall line, say beyond Richmond or Fredericksburg, because we don't routinely survey out there. Occasionally, we'll do flights, and the game department has done some flights uh, up some of the inland areas, like the James goes all the way to the mountains, and we've flown the James all the way up there. What happens is that, you know, after... As we go above Richmond, the density drops off considerably as the, that um, water body narrows. And so where we might have a pair, you know, every couple hundred meters or so in parts of the lower James, on the upper James, like where you're talking about, or the Shenandoah, it's typically a pair every 10 miles of shoreline or so. So that, those parts, you know, those physiographic areas don't have the capacity to support the same kinds of densities, but they're definitely supporting more eagles all the time. So th those areas are being colonized rapidly, you know, all the way up the Potomac, all the way up the Rappahannock, all the way up the James, the Roanoke, the New, all those areas are being uh, colonized. There are several pairs now on the Shenandoah uh, River there, uh, but we don't have as good a handle on them as we do down here. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.